How about now? Can you hear me now? I honestly didn't realize that my mic had not triggered for some reason. Something in my settings must have been off. <laughs> so let me know if you guys can hear me now. Cool. So we'll start over again, I guess. A little annoying, but sometimes that's the way it goes with these uh, technical things. So what I was saying is that this was the color scheme I was originally looking at for my cloaks. I was going to do this kind of teal green color. So this is a uh, custom color that I mixed up. It's two parts Cabalite green to one part Stegodon scale green. And then I layer it up with just normal Cabalite green and then highlight the edges with Cyberite green. And the idea sounded interesting on paper and it turned out all right on some of the other projects where I've used those colors. But putting it on the model here, I decided that it wasn't quite what I was going with or going for rather. And then when I was painting my tutorial for tomorrow, which is this guy here, I decided that I really liked the way this blue turned out. So I think I've decided this is what I'm gonna go with for my main scheme. I don't wanna completely abandon the green, so I think I might try to incorporate it into my scheme. I'm thinking maybe anything that's not human will get the green cloaks. So like maybe my minotaurs will have it on their, their loincloths or something. We'll figure that out. But uh, yeah, this is what I'm going to be going with for the scheme. And the main difference will be that on the hoplites, we won't have the silver on the chest plate. The only reason that the Polmark has it is because he's actually almost entirely mechanical other than his face. So, we'll get started. We're going to be using Sotek Green as our first color. We're starting with the cloaks, and the reason we're starting with the cloaks is because kind of the way these models are designed, when you look at them, all this detail, well, not really detail, but all the cloak that's up under here, if you do the armor first, you're not going to be able to get up in those crevices without overpainting. So we're going to do them first. So let me get some paint ready to go here. Red is going to look really cool on your city states. You'll have to send pictures in all of the conquest, like Facebook chats and everything. Because that'll look really good. I did see one guy that's already started painting his hoplites, and he did red, but he did like red and black stripes on the plume, which I thought was super cool. Okay, so I'm using kind of my ugliest brush for the base color, since we don't have to be pretty with this since it's the first color we're putting on the model. And I've watered it down quite a bit. I like to have my paints be nice and thin, just because I really don't like getting any sort of chalky texture in the paint. I also find that painting with thinner paints reduces the amount of brush stroke lines that you'll get on your model. And we're gonna see how the pacing on this goes. If uh, it's taking too long to do one model, then we'll just focus on the one model but I was kind of thinking we might batch paint the three models that are sitting here behind the camera, well, not behind the camera, in front of the camera. Because we only have three hours in tonight's stream, so we're not gonna, we most likely won't finish. I mean, maybe we will. The scheme's not too complicated, but I, I kind of anticipate that we'll come just short of finishing these tonight.
You know, I think we're going to see a lot of 300 themed city-states armies. It's just a popular movie, popular theme, and I think it's what most people think of when they think of Greeks and Spartans and everything like that. If I'm not mistaken, the blue scheme that I'm doing is more closely related to Athens and kind of the colors they used to wear. But don't quote me on that, because I got that from Google, and you know how Google is. Using a gold spray is probably smart. I just don't like paying for the gold spray. Uh, the one that I like is the Games Workshop one, and it's like 25 bucks a can. So unless I'm doing a lot of gold, I won't buy it. In this case, I'm not really using an actual gold on the models. I'm actually basing these in a copper, and then I mix a little bit of gold in with the copper to bring it up to a bronze color. Okay, this is the first coat on this model, so... Oh, I guess we gotta do the plume. Can't forget that. And I guess he's got his... Never mind, we're not moving on yet. Because we've still got his little loincloth thing, too. So one thing I'll note that was kind of annoying when I was painting the uh, pull mark, because of how wide their stances are, their feet hang just barely off the base plate. I had to repaint the toes on the pull mark probably about 10 times during the painting process. Even just trying to varnish the model, I kept rubbing the paint off the toes, just because when you're holding the actual base, you just tend to rub up against it a lot. Suppose you could fix that by using a painting handle, but I've always just gotten used to painting this way, so this is how I'm doing it. Yeah, we're getting the, uh, you mentioned there, Rafal, that we're getting two more units in the summer. We'll be getting the, um, the Agima and the, I've got to remember, the Thorakites, I believe is the name of the other one that we're getting. And those will be coming in, I believe it's May, it's either April or May. I'm pretty excited for those. Excited to see what they look like. And I'm assuming that'll be a dual kit. So right now I'm trying to get up under the uh, bottom of the tabard pieces. It's not a super important area to paint, but I just like to be picky like that. I know you guys probably can't see that at all, so it doesn't matter a whole lot. Move on to our second model, because we got to let that dry before I can put a second coat on. So I guess it's important to clarify, like, when the new stuff releases, there's the month it goes up for pre-order, and then the month it actually hits shelves. Um, I just put in, well, supposed to have put in today my pre-orders for March, and March was just the uh, Old Dominion stuff, so they've got the Varangians and the, um, it slipped my mind what the other kit that's built out of that set will be. And then the Dwegom are getting their Herald of Magma. 
And then next month, the Giants will go for pre-order, but they don't actually drop until April. Like, they won't be in our hands until April, according to the order form, at least. Are just catching up on the chat here. Oh, you're right. It's not the Herald of Magma. It is Wadroon. It's uh, the Chieftain and the Veterans for the Wadroon. Um, I was just looking at the order form this morning because they sent us an updated one uh, with the weekly or the monthly Vanguard newsletter. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that they've also given us a release, rough release date for the Ashen Dawn for the Hundred Kingdoms. Those are coming in May, which means those will be up for pre-order sometime in April. And I have seen the sculpts for the Ashen Dawn. I've seen the renders, rather. I got to see those while we were at LVO, and those are going to be really cool. You guys will like them once they actually reveal the models to us. That was really the only thing that I noticed on the order form that was new, though. Um, we know that at some point in time and later in the year, we're going to get a bunch of Wadroon stuff, which will be really cool. We'll be getting uh, Thunder Cavalry and um, the Tauntor this year, which will be really cool. Those will be good additions for the Wadroon. And I know my wife is probably super excited to get a hold of them, especially the Thunder Riders. That's been one of the units we've anticipated most for her Wadroon army. So the email we got for the vanguards this morning that had the new order form said that the new items in the order form were public information. They just haven't like done a happy hour to announce that stuff. So we're allowed to talk about that. And then as far as the Thunder Riders and stuff, that was uh, Stavro was telling people at LVO. If you asked, something you'll find with the guys at Parabellum, they're awesome guys. And if you ever get to meet them in person, you can directly ask them what stuff they're working on. And not all of them will show you cool stuff, but if you ask Stavro, if you manage to corner him, uh, he'll just flat out sh pull out his phone and start showing you pictures of the renders and stuff. He's cool like that. He likes to see people's enthusiasm and excitement for the game. And if that means spoiling a couple things, that's something he seems to be okay with doing, which is fine. So we are going to start repainting this one. Say goodbye to the green. It's going away. Clean out my brush here because it's getting a little gross looking. One of the bad habits I have for painting, when I'm doing base colors like this, where I don't need to be super careful and pretty about it, I tend to also forget to rinse my brush. So I end up destroying a lot of brushes. My base brushes are probably the ones I go through the most.
Oops, bumped the camera there. Let's uh, fix that a little bit. So painting like this is really weird because I'm used to having the camera between me and the model. But when I stream, I also have to have the microphone right up here in my face. So every time I go to paint, I have to reach around the microphone to be able to get to the model. It's kind of silly. <laughs> I see you uh, commented there that you just got your city-states 30 minutes ago. That's exciting. So does that mean uh, you're sitting down right now putting them together while we watch the stream here? Or have you got other projects you're working on tonight? So we've got the first coat down on the three. Now we are going to leave the fourth one, the uh, leader model. He is going to be saved for painting probably over the weekend because I'm going to record a tutorial so that people that don't feel like watching the three hour long live stream can watch the five minute tutorial instead. That was just my can of soda there. I guess it decided it was going to make noise. Now let's see. Before we begin this next coat, looks like we're dry enough to put the next coat on. So we'll go ahead and jump into it. Now I did just throw a bit more water in the paint that I had. So yeah, it's a little too thin. Throw just a little bit more paint in there. I like to... So I don't use wet palettes. I use just a plastic dry palette and part of that is just because I tend to not get along with mildew and mold very well and I've always found that wet palettes when you use them as often as I'm using a palette to paint they tend to just never stay clean they always end up smelling all mildewy and moldy So I've chosen to forego that. As a result, I often uh, will just add additional water to the remaining paint just to keep it from getting dried out, and sometimes I overdo it. But when you're batch painting and doing several models, that's fine because I'm going to use up all the paint. It's not going to go to waste.
So I was just trying to look at the uh, the stream page here on my computer because last time it would tell me how many people are watching. But YouTube must have changed their format or something because now it doesn't show me how many people are actually watching at one time. Oh well. Not a huge thing. Obviously, uh, excuse me. Obviously, some of you are watching because otherwise the chat wouldn't have anybody commenting. So, I will just have to trust that YouTube is uh, actually getting people to watch this. <laughs> so while we're doing these painting streams, if you guys have any questions you want to ask me, feel free to ask them. And if it's something I'm allowed to talk about, we'll talk about it. Like obviously I can't talk about stuff that's currently in playtesting because uh, it's in playtesting, so telling you about it wouldn't do any good because it's not set in stone yet. But last week we even were, we even took a moment to take a break from building models and uh, answered some rules questions last week and that was kind of fun to sit here and thumb through the rule book with you guys. I think because of how much I watered this down, it will take three coats to get the coverage I want. That's my own fault. Something you guys will find watching me paint live versus watching the tutorials. The tutorials, I get to polish them up nice and make it look nice, and I only show you the 30 seconds of each step that I want to show. When painting live, you guys get to see all the mistakes. It's kind of interesting, kind of nerve-wracking, really. I start to realize I'm actually not all that great at painting. I just uh, present myself as if I were. Since this is one of our first couple streams, I'd also appreciate it if uh, at any point in time the music is too loud and you can't hear my voice, or maybe I'm not speaking loud enough, let me know, because I can't, uh, I don't hear myself. I can go back afterwards and watch the stream, but during the stream, I just have to trust that things are working out alright, so if you guys don't let me know there's a problem, I can't fix it. Just like at the beginning of the stream when uh, apparently my mic wasn't turned on and so I was just uh, talking to myself. Waving my hands around on screen and pointing at things on the model and you guys couldn't tell what I was saying. Kind of funny really. <laughs> So one thing when you're base coating and you have little fine details or like crevices between stuff, make sure that you don't let the paint pool up too much. It's worth it to do multiple thinner coats than to put too much paint in a spot and have it cover up the details. And I comment on that because I was noticing like up at the plume here on this one I was going a little too heavy and there was paint pooling up between the different fibers of the plume. And especially when it's a detail that is very obvious, like the head of the model. You want to make sure you don't do anything to ruin the details on the head. 
because most people just naturally when they look at a model they look at the face or where you know a face would exist on the model if it's humanoid and then the second place they actually look is usually the base plate kind of interesting it's just something that people do without thinking about it at least that's what I've heard so you always want to make sure that the the head of your model looks good and that the base plate at least looks good enough that people don't lose interest after seeing the base plate because then they you know from there their eyes will naturally move up the model So, Rafal, you've got a pretty good question there. So this set, uh, the four, le uh, not Legionnaires, the four Hoplites that you see here are all one sprue. The set comes with three sprues, so you can build three of the just casually standing there with the spear straight up guys. Which actually brings me to a good point, something I'll point out here. Let me just finish putting this coat of paint on this model. So the model with his spear standing straight up is kind of a slightly annoying model. I'll show you why here in just a second. So this model here only works with one of the shields in the set, at least of the four that I've tried. There is one extra shield uh, because I did the leader model in this group of four. So the way that the elbow on the shield lines up, it's a ball and socket, and the nub that it connects onto is right here. It's this little tiny thing. This is the only arm that looks natural while sitting on that ball and socket. If you try to put, say, like this arm on, the cloak actually stops you from getting all the way there with the ball and socket and so like you could maybe after playing with it get it to kind of look okay but for the most part he can only take this particular shield so if you're hoping to have each of your guys look different across your stands you might be a little disappointed on that particular model the rest of them, from what I could see, all the shields work with all the poses. It was just the one pose that wasn't compatible with all the shields. Okay, so we're starting on the third coat. This will probably be the final coat of this color. Um, I usually keep layering the paint until I cannot see the black that's underneath. The reason I did a black base with this, normally when you do bright colors, like especially bright blues and stuff, you do a white or a light gray base underneath. I did a black on this one because I know that I'm doing metallic armor. And when you're going to be working with a lot of metallics, you either want to just go ahead and prime it with a metallic or do a black. I've always found that metallic paints get along best with a black base. I assume it's just something with the way that the little metal fragments in the paint work or something. Just the way the pigment is. I don't know the science behind it, but I've always just found that black bases work the best for painting metallics. So that's why I've done a black base. It does mean I have to do one to two extra base coats for the non-metallic colors though. Oh man, this is a hard spot to get to. I just realized that I hadn't painted the back of his little loincloth. Will there be any resin upgrade sets for these models? So, I suppose it depends on what you're thinking of when you say resin upgrade sets. Um, there will be 
as far as I'm aware, there will be the uh, like the command models, the officers, things like the Dora Lighties or the uh, I'm trying to think of what are the names of some of the other officer models that they have are. Um, now, if you're referring to like alternate shields, I don't know. I don't have any answer on that. I would assume that the organized play kit, it would certainly make sense for them to throw alternate shields for the hoplites in there. So they did that with the legionnaires, they did that with the men at arms, where the organized play kits had like prize sprue, not sprues, but just bits that you could get for upgrading them. But I've not heard anything official on whether or not there will be anything like that for these guys. You know, I'm kind of surprised they didn't do the, the Spartan V shields. Maybe they're saving them for one of the more elite infantry options? Who knows? And like I said, I think I could see them easily throwing in a set of shields on the organized play kit. Making it so you have to win them in a tournament. That'd actually be kind of a... I'd go play in a tournament for a chance to win some cool shields. Now I think I have the sprues nearby. I can show you kind of what extra pieces you get per each sprue, maybe. So here's the sprue before the pieces have been clipped off. And you can see there's four shields, and then in the case of the leader, there was a extra sprue with another shield on it. And then once you've cut the squad out, you're left with this for extra pieces. So like, we've got an extra shield. Uh, in each box, you really only come out with one extra shield, just the one that would be on the leader model. Um, you do have a lot of spear options, though. We've got an alternate spear that's sitting straight up. Now, some of these, it's important to note, these longer ones, like this one, those are for the uh, phalangites. Actually, now that I look at it, it really does look like you don't get extra hoplite spears if you build hoplites. And if you built the phalangites, I'm assuming it would be the same way around, where your leftovers would just be the the hoplite guys so that's a little bit different from say the legionnaire kit for the old dominion that thing had probably two to three extra spears per sprue now what you do get out of this kit is lots of extra heads so like this is the uh, you get three of this sprue in the set as well and you've got I think three different extra heads on this sprue uh, make that five. Five extra heads. Looks like four bases and then five different faceplates. So the heads are going to be where you get your most customization out of this kit. I agree with you there. The plumes on these helmets are beautiful. These models just across the board are really cool looking. I'm super excited to get a whole army of these painted up and on the table. I think it's just going to look really cool. It's going to draw a lot of attention, especially for demoing the game. 
I run demos once a month at one of the local stores. And these are going to turn some heads. I know the Old Dominion do that as well. I always have my Old Dominion on display. Same with the Wadroon. Those armies just draw a lot of attention. So at this point I'm just kind of touching up any spots where the paint isn't quite covering how I want it to. And then once we're done with that we'll get on to shading these. Looks like we're about 45 minutes into our stream here so moving about as slow as I expected. I apologize. I'll say this, I am not a speed painter. And especially not with the city-states. They, they're not complicated models, like compared to some of the other models I've painted for Conquest, for Warhammer, for everything. These are faster to paint. But I'm also trying to take my time on this army because I want this to be kind of my showcase army in the long run. Because I just really love the model design. <laughs> hey, welcome from Texas. That makes uh, at least two people from Texas that I've uh, seen on here tonight. Another habit that I've noticed I have as I've been painting here tonight, I'll start painting with the model up here where it's supposed to be. And then as I paint, I slowly push the model away. It's kind of... I don't know why I do that. But it just kind of happens naturally without me thinking about it. The other struggle I'm having is I like to move the model around a lot so that I can see where I'm putting the paint. But I also have to remember that I'm sitting slightly higher than the camera and so the angle that is best for me might not be an angle that you guys can see from. Okay, we need to get just a little bit more paint. Sorry, bringing the sprue back out. So, from what I can tell, I don't think the different variations of the unit have different heads, uh, like that they're supposed to go with. Let's see, get the instructions out here. So in the instructions, they do build them with different heads. So for example, like the leader model, they encourage you with the Phalangites to do this plume here, which is, you know, a front to back plume and it sticks up a lot. Whereas the hoplites, they encourage you to do the side to side plume. And then... It looks like what they do for the phalangites is they encourage you to use these helmets that have uh, a metal ridge instead of a plume. But, at the end of the day, the heads are not what tell the units apart. It's the, uh, it's the weapons they're carrying that tell them apart. Because the hoplites have the shields and the phalangites don't. Okay, I think we are to the point where once this dries completely, we can do our shade. Although I am going to keep a little bit of the paint that we used on hand to touch up spots that didn't quite get enough paint. Yeah, that's one way to explain why I slowly push the model away from the camera, except I do it when I'm recording too, like when I'm recording for my tutorials. My theory is that the reason I move my hands away from the camera slowly is because I think when I start on a project, I want the model close up to my face so I can see it. 
but then as I start painting and I no longer need to be up close to the model, I think it's more like my eyes just automatically tell my hands to push the model further away from my face. That's my theory. Could also be that I'm always trying to tell myself to sit up straight. And sitting up straight usually means kind of changing your posture, and maybe that results in me moving further away from the camera. I don't know. Okay. So when you get around to shading these, one thing to always watch for, the paint always dries slowest on the inside of the cape. And sometimes that's because it's harder to make sure you put smaller amounts of paint down there because you can't necessarily always see how much paint you're putting in those recesses. And sometimes it's just that those spots aren't getting the airflow that the paint needs to dry fast. So before you start shading, always check the insides of the cloaks. Because there's nothing worse than going through with your shade paint and then discovering that you still had wet paint and now your shade paint has absorbed all the pigment from it. And your shade paint is now a different color. Like all that's left on this model is a couple little touch ups down between the legs and around the legs. And then, of course, the back of that tabard bit that we ha can't quite get to. I have to go in with a longer bristle brush to get to that. We'll do that. Let me grab a longer brush. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah, that worked like a charm. Well, that solved that problem. So I personally will probably be taking the pull mark as my character. I'll probably almost always run a pair of pull marks with one of them being my warlord. I like his warlord trait or his uh, supremacy ability better. Just because I just do. I don't know. Not a particular reason. Uh, unit composition is the biggest thing. I'm really in love with the Minotaur models. And the pull mark can take Minotaurs both as mainstay and restricted. So that means that we will take a lot of Minotaurs if I take him as my Warlord. Well, and just if I take him in general. So that's personally my favorite character. Now, once we get around to more characters coming out for the game, I am really excited for the Eidolon. I've been told that he's basically going to be like Clockwork Iron Man where it's going to be a guy in a mech suit and I'm assuming that because he has kind of two different versions of his rules in the rulebook because he has his base rules and then he has the alternate Soma I'm assuming that he'll come with customization options to represent the two different chassis that he can wear That's a good question. What first got me into Conquest? So, I was working for a game store right before the pandemic. They sent me to the Gamma Expo, which is a like a gaming convention for game store owners and staff and stuff. It's like a big networking convention. It was a lot of fun. But I went there, and Leo and Stavro were both 
presenting Conquest there. I saw the models, and I was like, okay, these are cool. And then I sat and chatted with Stavro for probably an hour or so, and he just started explaining the lore of Conquest. And let me tell you, Stavro can sell Conquest just off the lore. They could have ugly miniatures, and Stavro could still sell it just off the lore. Like, he's good at his job. Which makes sense, because, I mean, he's kind of the, the guy that made the game happen, so... I sat and chatted with him, and by the end of that convention, I was pretty much hooked on Conquest. I got a starter set from Gamma, and then it kind of sat around for a few months and didn't do anything. Um, because I was busy with a lot of like Warhammer events that I was running and stuff like that. And then COVID hit, and ended up having free time, so I got to work on them, and I fell in love with the models. And now here I am. Okay. Sorry, I had to dig out a color that I forgot to set aside before starting the stream tonight. So to shade these models... We're going to be using Contrast Talazar Blue. Now, I'm going to be thinning this down just here on the palette. Probably about a 1 to 1 ratio, maybe slightly less than 1 to 1 in favor of the Talazar Blue. So that this will end up functioning like a shade and not a contrast paint. quite sure how much of this I'm going to need, so I'll probably end up diluting too much. One downside to diluting contrast paints is once you've diluted them, you really can't throw them back in the pot without throwing off the consistency of the whole pot. So, whatever excess I dilute here just goes to waste. If you guys want to see that, I'm just here. My little palette throw in some drops of water. Now I did start this with clean water and since we've only used a blue color any pigment that's in that water is not going to hurt this contrast. Eh, one more drop. So now it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to show the consistency but it's pretty watered down now. And like I said earlier, make sure that your model is dry before you start shading. And we're just going to toss some of this on here and we're going to spread it out. We start pretty thick and then we spread it out across the cape. You don't necessarily have to even do this step if you don't want to. I do it because it turns the cape more towards the blue that's in the Sotek green color rather than the, the teal green that's in there. But since it's a darker color, you could just go ahead and start painting the lighter colors over it and layering it up, and it would still look just fine. So this shading is purely personal preference. And I am going what I would consider pretty heavy with this shade. I'm being pretty generous with it. I did not answer the question about the super glue. So when it, it depends on the model I'm using. My favorite super glue brand is Loctite which I think I left in the other room because I was using it to build some terrain with my conquest group last night. Oops. When it comes to gluing plastic models though, for the most part I actually prefer plastic glue because it welds the pieces together. 
So unless you know you're going to be converting a model and taking it apart later and doing more work on it, you might as well just weld the model together. Um, normally I like to use the Games Workshop plastic glue because it acts a little faster than generic ones. But right now I've just been using this one that I got at Hobby Lobby. And it smells like oranges, which is weird. <laughs> but that tends to be what I use for gluing my models. But if I'm doing a resin model, like I said, it's Loctite. Uh, I usually do the liquid one. They do sell gel glues, and I know a couple people that really love using Loctite gel super glue. I personally prefer the liquid one just because it lasts longer for my money that I spend on it. The gel glue tends to only come in smaller bottles, and they cost almost as much as the bigger bottle of liquid. So I usually buy the liquid super glue. Especially when I'm doing terrain projects because I need it in I need quantity over quality in that situation. Sorry, just trying to catch up on the chat here. I kind of lost track of it there for a minute, and it's uh, gotten a little bit ahead of me. So, that's another thing that's important to note. When I use plastic glue, it's always assembling before painting. I don't think I've ever used plastic glue to glue already painted components together. If I'm doing sub-assemblies, I will usually use super glue to put those pieces together afterwards. I'll just use that same Loctite glue. So for example, like this guy here, Angron. Uh, he's a little too tall for the camera angle I've got here, but uh, I've left his arms and his armor off. I will end up gluing those with super glue once they're painted. And you just have to be careful not to put so much super glue on that you end up sticking your fingers to the model and ripping the paint off, because I've done that plenty of times. I think the main situations where I see people using the gel glue uh, with the super glue is usually on pieces um, that pieces that you need to hold. Like, I'm trying to think of how I'm trying to say this. Uh, whenever you have two pieces that don't fit snugly together, and you're gonna have to hold them for a minute that's when the gel glue comes in handy because since it's gel and not liquid you don't usually have to hold it for as long so you can put the glue in place and then go work on a different piece while that glue is drying whereas with liquid super glue depending on how fast dry how fast the dry time on that glue is you might have to hold the model for a minute and especially with resin models, some resins just do not like super glue. So you end up having to hold the model for quite a while before it sticks properly. I went a little too heavy on this one. So with this shade, if you catch it early enough and you've gone too heavy, you can just absorb the excess shade. If it's already started to dry, you're better off just leaving it because when it's partially dry, the part that's puddled up will usually have a ring that's developed around where it's already dried. So you're better off just leaving it and then painting over it later if you've uh, 
let too much pool up in one spot. Unless, of course, it's in a recess where there's a lot of details that you want to preserve. That's a different situation. Okay, so we've kind of just got to let this dry now. Even with the batch painting three of them, the shade is not drying as fast as I can apply it. So we'll, I guess, wait and just chat for a minute. Oops, knocking guys over. So I suppose if we wanted to, while that shade is drying, we can work a little bit on the copper base that we're gonna put on here. And by the time we get through that, the blue should be dry. From here on out, we're not using the 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 larger, more destroyed brush, we're going to be using a finer brush. So we'll have a little more control, so it's okay if we do some of the armor now. We shouldn't have too much issue with having to repaint or anything like that. So I'm going to use Balthazar Gold. This is kind of my go-to copper. Um, at least for darker coppers. I do have, we'll be using later on for the next step of the metal. I have this Pro Acryl copper, and as you can kind of see, it's it's a lighter copper. It's almost more of a brass or a bronze color, which is why we'll be using it later, because it's going to come out looking a bit more like this. So, but this is my go-to copper. That's a good point, Zar Gifli. The gel glues do tend to help with gap filling if you're doing conversion work. I don't do a ton of conversion work. I'll do a little bit here and there. For example, like here's one of my current conversions. Uh, working on turning a rock gut trogoth into a killer can. So I've got a 3D printed arm and I've got to fill in a bunch of gap and stuff here on the back. Anyway. But I don't do too much with converting. Most of the time it's just because I don't have time to do that and still keep up with all my army projects. Converting can be time consuming. It's very rewarding, but it can take a while. Now something that you guys might say I'm a heretic for doing. I have my copper paint here. I am actually gonna water it down. Most people will tell you not to water down metallics because it makes some of the little metallic shards in the paint go a little wonky. I find the key is just not to overdo it. So you're only putting small amounts of water in it, and then you just gotta make sure you mix it up really well. I personally think most companies that make metallics have them too thick when they first come out of the bottle. So I like to thin them just enough that they, I try to hit the point where they still go on in a single coat, because metallics, you usually want them to go on a single coat, if you can. But thin enough that I don't get gross brush stroke lines. So we're gonna start with the shield here. And we're doing the shield first because we can kind of just be sloppy with it. So I might have to do a second coat in some spots because I thinned it down pretty good. But for the most part, you can see like 
it goes on in a coat and it looks decent. There's only a few spots where the black is showing through a little bit too much. And some of this I'm not worried about because like all the detail, like the symbols and trim, will probably end up in a silver color in the long run anyway. For now I'm just going to do the one side because otherwise I'm going to end up painting my hand a bunch. If I can hold on to the model. The shield designs are super interesting. This shield in particular, I'm trying to decide how practical it would be. It might actually work really well because it's got all these rivets in like the little indents from the design means that weapons that hit it aren't going to be sliding, like especially when you're spear against spear and have pole arms clashing into this, they're not going to be sliding, they're going to hit those ridges and get stuck. Which means this shield is actually probably pretty good for jamming pole arms. Which makes sense, because they're a squad that's carrying all pole arms, so they would probably be trained to fight other regiments of the same loadout. I'm going to switch to a little bit more controlled brush here. One that looks a little bit prettier but isn't quite a fine tip. And we'll start applying this copper to the armor panels. And we're in no hurry with this. I find that it's worth it to take your time and not have to repaint anything if you can avoid it. What I have to decide here is, oops, so there's this little ridge right here. I'm trying to decide if that is a belt or part of the breastplate because it could go either way. The way it's designed, it follows perfectly and evenly around the whole base of the breastplate. So it could go either way, I think. Now, when I'm working with metallics, I like to rinse my brush a lot. Basically every time the brush no longer has paint in it I rinse it because metallics tend to dry pretty fast and if they're if you're not rinsing your brush out between I guess dips in the paint if you want to call it that you tend to get paint slowly drying in the bristles of your brush and it just destroys brushes. So always rinse your brush frequently when you're working with metallics. And really when you're working with Games Workshop paints like I am right now, uh, any base color is going to do the same thing. So you want to rinse your brush a lot. Now right in through here where the cape and the armor piece connect, it's 
kind of hard to not overpaint through there. I'm actually going to grab an even finer brush just to get in those crevices. If you do overpaint, you can pretty easily just get your brush wet and then rinse the paint out and then just soak it up with a dry brush. Kind of like a, an eraser. As long as the paint hasn't started drying yet, you're still okay. And while we've got this finer brush, we'll also get the kind of further back parts of the uh, breastplate. In theory, you don't have to get the parts that are further back because they're not really visible once the model's all painted up and has a shield on. But I'm going to... I'm picky. If I can see it from any angle while I'm painting, I like to try and paint it. In fact, I used to, when I first got into painting models, I used to paint everything as individual pieces and then glue it all together. I was crazy. almost feel like that's a jab there, Zar G Flea. Uh, Cause I definitely am a brush licker. As weird as that may sound. So yes, if you don't rinse your brush out, you do end up tasting the paint. If you don't rinse it completely. So the heads on these guys are really interesting because they have the gaps in the helmet where the face would be, but there's not really any face details sculpted in there. I noticed that the box art just leaves them black. So I'm thinking I might do the same because looking at it, there's really no face to be had underneath this helmet. Which I understand, that's uh, kind of a redundant detail when most of the face is covered and nobody's going to want to paint little teeny tiny portions of a face that are not even going to be noticeable because of how cool the helmets are. Now, it's important to note with uh, my comment about painting all the pieces and then gluing them, that was back when uh, Space Marines were really just a torso, legs, and arms, and a head. So, like, it was five to six pieces per model. This was before they started having five different pieces to build just the legs. With modern design philosophies that companies use for their miniatures, you would not want to paint each piece and then glue them together. I would call you crazy if you did. And Jocelyn, you're certainly right. Some paints don't taste very good. Uh, it's been my experience that shade paints are the ones that taste the worst. Even after a good rinse of the brush, the shade paints leave your brush tasting bad for a little bit. Just my experience.
spending a lot of time on this helmet. I'm discovering there's a lot of weird little angles that you gotta get to to get everything covered. And then you got this little spot right here where like there could be the gap for hearing for the ears but they designed it in such a way that you can't really tell if it's supposed to be a continuation of the helmet or a gap so we're just gonna paint it over So, I've never actually drank paint water. What I have done is I have accidentally rinsed my brush in my soda before. So, kind of similar. Um, I have the big Citadel paint cup, so it doesn't look like a drinking cup, so I've never had the issue of accidentally drinking it. Okay, back to a slightly larger brush. Now that we're moving away from the cloak. So I think what we'll do, looking at how long this is taking me to paint this armor, we'll focus on getting this one model through the next few steps, and then we'll worry about going back to the others, because I want to make sure that we get far enough into a single model that you guys actually get to start seeing this come together. Because unfortunately there's some parts like painting all the armor that takes a minute because you just gotta find where it's all at and I don't want to spend the whole stream doing the same two steps across all the models. Now this particular hoplite, it looks like his greaves wrap all the way around the leg. So if you were seeing me paint this and being like, oh no, why are you painting the back of the leg? It's because this one's a fully enclosed armor piece. Whereas like the uh, pull mark, he really only has the armor plate on the front side of the leg because his legs are mechanical. So the back side is all mechanical gears and stuff. So, the uh, Citadel Cups are interesting. I The only reason I have one is because it was given to me uh, back when I worked at a game store here locally. I was given one because nobody ever buys them, and they were like, well, here, you have one because you paint a lot. I do like it. Um, whether it's worth spending extra money on, I suppose, is a matter of personal opinion. It has some useful features. For example, it's got little um, like little crossbars that go across the bottom, little plastic bars that are used for scraping your brush along the bottom. Like if you were doing a dry brush and you're trying to clean it out, you could scrape the bristles along the bottom of the cup and it helps get the paint out. And it has these on the back of the cup. Mine are disgusting because this is an old cup, but it has these little indents that run down the length of the cup that are supposed to be there for the purpose of um, as you rinse your brush you could run them up those and twist and it would restore your fine point on the brush. But with how much I use it I've just found that it's slowly filled up with bits of paint that just deposited there because evaporation, you know, hard water, we have hard water around here, so it just slowly filled up, and so I don't ever use those little recesses for maintaining my brush at all. I think its biggest benefit is that it's not easily confused with a drinking cup. Which, I mean, that's, that's not something to ignore. That's certainly a valuable uh, kind of design thing with the cup. 
Okay, so I think on this first hoplite, we've done all the armor because his arm is mechanical from the elbow down. So we're going to do that with uh, lead belcher later on. Let's grab the back side of his shield here. And then we'll get the sides of it as well. Now, one thing I really like with the hoplite kit compared to some of the other conquest models, they actually connected the arm to the shield. Which has been one of my number one complaints with past kits where the shield glues onto the arm as a separate piece. Because I'm always, always breaking off shields. So I'm very happy that the arm is actually connected to the shields on these guys. Hey, thank you for that little uh, little tip there. That's very nice of you. Uh, Reman Cryodil. Thank you very much. Sorry, I had to make sure I could say the name properly. Those little tips go a long way to making sure that we can keep doing stuff like this. So I am still a very, very small channel compared to some of the other channels that are out there. So the reason we only painted the front of the shield before is because now I can grab the front of the shield with one finger and the arm on the back and I can paint those ridges without also painting my fingers for the most part. I always end up painting the fingers a little bit. I'll put that down. Do the same thing with this other shield. Now technically the copper paint on the hoplite that we were just working on is ready to go. We could throw a shade on it right now. But I'm giving it just a minute to kind of cure just a little bit more. So that it doesn't react with the shade at all. So it's kind of funny. My city-states that I ordered actually haven't arrived yet. They won't arrive till middle of next week. These ones that I'm painting right now were sent to me by Parabellum as a surprise. Like, I had asked if there was going to be any option to get some early like preview models so that I could paint some tutorials, so there could be paint tutorials when the models come out for everybody else. And the answer I got was actually like, oh, we don't know, we'll, we'll get back to you. And so I think they decided that it would be fun to just surprise me and not tell me they were coming. I didn't have any tracking or anything. Just all of a sudden one day they showed up. It was a super, super happy surprise. Like we wouldn't be doing this stream right now if they hadn't arrived when they did. Zargiefly, you say you're starting to regret your two energy drinks you've had today. Um, I can only imagine that if you're trying to paint right now, it's making life miserable. Because when I down an energy drink, if I do it too fast, the caffeine's just barely enough to make my hands shaky enough that painting is not enjoyable. I don't know if you have that same issue. Looks like we will have to do additional coat of paint on the shield here. One of the nice things about these uh, Citadel metallics is they dry really, really fast. So often by the time you finish applying the paint to a model, the areas where you started on that model have already dried. Or like in this case, 
I set down the shield long enough to take a drink and it's dry. Okay, we're going to repaint the front a little bit too just to help it look good. Make sure we get the full coverage and everything. So, so far I've heard people say red for their city-states. What other uh, color scheme ideas do we have out there? Does anybody else have something crazy they're going to do with theirs? <laughs> Funny you should mention that, ZRG Fleet. I'm also drinking a uh, Mountain Dew Pitch Black, although I am drinking the normal one, not the energy drink one. Okay, we're going to shade this model, uh, assuming that I actually set the shade aside. There it is, aha. Uh -huh. So for this model, we're actually gonna use um, Contrast Gilliman Flesh for our shade. Now you could use Agrax Earth Shade or Reichland Flesh Shade or Seraphim Sepia or a whole bunch of other colors. I chose Gilliman Flesh because of a couple reasons. It has a sort of pinkish tone to it that helps kind of turn that copper a little bit more red which contributes to the the brass look that we're going for or bronze look I always get those two mixed up um, and then the second reason is because it doesn't come out as dirty looking as say Agrax Earthshade because it's a paint that's not intended initially to be a shade That could be cool. Dark green armor with frost green cloth and off white for the cloth and brass trim. And dark blue and gold and black cloaks. And red and brass for the minotaurs. Sounds like it'll be a very colorful army to look at. Are you thinking like you, you mentioned multiple cloak colors. Are you going to do, um, like, multiple colors in the same regiment? Or will you have, like, each regiment have its own color that all the cloaks in that regiment are the same? So I am doing the shade right now, and I'm going... I'm not going terribly heavy. Just heavy enough that it's pooling up in the recesses and spots where there's detail to pool up around. And you can kind of see it's it's brown, but it's also got that little bit of a pink tone to it. And that's because it is a it's meant to be a flesh tone contrast paint. It's kind of funny contrast paints in my opinion actually make some of the best shades they just work really well and you can water them down to any consistency so it can be anything from its intended purpose all the way down to being used as a very fine glaze and as I do this I'm being careful not to get this on the blue as much as possible if I do get it on there, it won't be a huge issue because uh, we're going to go back and paint over the blue anyway. OK, 
Okay, let's grab the shield real quick. Make sure it looks dry. The back side of the shields, you don't necessarily have to go crazy with the shade because they're going to be kind of less visible as is. But I'm a weirdo and I like to shade the piece from every angle. Okay. So we're going to let that sit for a second. And I think while it's drying, we'll work on the cape again. So what we're going to do next on the cape, when I did the hop, not the hoplite, the pole mark, I went straight to temple guard blue, but one thing I think I'll change moving forward on these hoplites, the recesses ended up being really like, the transition was instant, so you had really dark in the recesses and then all of a sudden really light. So I think what I'm going to do for the hoplites is I'm actually going to do a one-to-one -one mix of the two paints first so that it gets a, a mid-tone between the two to help the transition. And then I'll do Temple Guard by itself. So we're doing Sotek Green and Temple Guard Blue mixed together right now. And give me just a second to get that color mixed up here. See how this color turns out. This color I'm doing right now is actually very similar to how I paint my Alpha Legion. The main difference being that when I paint my Alpha Legion for Warhammer, I do a, a teal shade instead of a blue shade. Uh, like a wash, the wash layer is teal. Okay, so now, I think we're gonna go ahead and do this layering with a finer brush, just because then we don't have to switch brushes when we get to the, the finer ridges like up here. So yeah, I think that's how we'll do it. And all we're doing here is taking this color and just layering it over on the raised parts of the cloak. And this might take a couple coats because I've thinned this down pretty good. When you're doing layering like this, you definitely want to thin the paints, not to the point of being a glaze, but thin them enough that some of the color that's underneath shows through because then you can control how many layers you do and you can kind of build up a little bit of a transition from the darker color to the lighter color. I don't know if I'm going to put that much effort into this particular cape. Uh, at this point, I just kind of need to get it progressing so this project can start to look good. But if I were doing like, say, a centerpiece model, I might spend more time doing thinner layers and building it up so that the color is most prominent at the most raised ridges. This is also one of those techniques where I always find that it looks weird at first. You really have to be patient with it and keep pushing through until it's done. Because it doesn't really start to look good until most of the highlighting is already done at least in my experience.
Ooh, that is an excellent question. So my favorite army for conquest... Um, I own every army except for the Dwegom. I only own one model for the Dwegom. It's kind of evolved. Right now my favorite gameplay-wise is probably the Old Dominion. That's the one I took to LVO. That's the one I main. That's the one I've put the most time into painting as well. However, I think city-states will probably steal their place from them once I get enough models to start actually playing them. Their rules during playtesting were a ton of fun. The army models, you know, they, they all look really cool. I think the, the Greek, Greek era up through the Romans is just a time period that I really like. Lots of cool history, a lot of cool mythology that comes from those time eras. And so the models just like, they just speak to me. They, We get along well, you might say. If I had to rank the armies from favorite to least favorite, it's probably going to end up being city-states, Old Dominion. Then from there... It's hard to say. I'd say maybe Nords next, because I think while their gameplay style isn't necessarily my my favorite, I think they're the next funnest models to work with and paint. And then from there, probably Spires in fourth place for me. The Spires were actually my first army. That's what I started as. And they're fun, but they're one of those armies where it's like some of the models I really love, and then there's other models that I just don't like. For example, the Abomination. It's a cool model, but it, I don't really like it. Just not an art style that I'm a super huge fan of, I guess. And then after the Spires, it's probably... Wadroon. And then Hundred Kingdoms, and then Dwegom were probably my least favorite faction in the game. And that's just because I tend to not be super crazy about dwarves in any of the miniatures games I play. The only dwarf army I, I own is the uh, the new Leagues of Votan for 40k. That's my first time ever buying dwarfs for a miniatures game. And that I mainly did because they look cool. They look like they stepped out of StarCraft. So yeah, the Dwegom were probably my least favorite. <laughs> uh, I suppose that's your choice. Here, you have the freedom to unsubscribe. It'd be sad to not have you with us anymore. <laughs> um, I also worry that if I played Dwegom, because I am a vanguard and I'm on the playtesting team and everything, I get to sit and listen to all the playtesters for the Dwegom talk about how they're broken and all the ways to break them. So I would worry too much that I would come out with really broken lists and just make everybody's day miserable. Not to say that Dwegon weren't fun to play against, but I feel like me playing them would not be fun to play against. I think I'd be a little too oppressive because they're an army where it's just very easy to... They're easy to be good at. As long as you understand list building, you can do really well with Dwegon. But that's just my opinion. Man, I didn't realize I was going to get so many uh, people upset about not being a dwarf fan. I don't dislike dwarves, you know. I, I like Tolkien's dwarves. They're fun. I like The Hobbit and all the characters in there. Just when it comes to my miniatures games, I guess I... 
I like orcs and humans better. The only reason I don't play uh, Wadroon on a regular basis is because my wife also plays them, and I usually try to not have duplicates of the same army in our collection, because while my wife does have her own models, we kind of share our collection in that they're all stored together, so I try to avoid having two of the same army. That just gets expensive. Otherwise, I would totally be running my little conquest dinosaur orcs. Czar G -Flay. I wouldn't say nobody likes fighting your Dwegom. I think it's just more that all the players in our group haven't figured out how to deal with them yet and still take the lists that they've been taking. Because we're in a meta where we played for a good six months building our lists before being introduced to the Dwegom. And so we all kind of got into a, a style of gameplay that we liked. And then we fought the Dwegom and realized that that style of gameplay just isn't great against a Dwegom gun line. See, I think they're fun to play against. They're just hard. I've only fought Dwegom two or three times now, and it's always been an uphill battle. It just... As an old Dominion player, Dwegom are just a hard army to deal with, because... At least, like, Wadroon can move fast enough, they can still get up there and get into melee with Dwegom. Same with Nords. Most of the armies have things that can get up there and kind of put pressure on the Dwegom. The Old Dominion, at least the way I play them, they don't have a whole lot of that. Bone Golems are okay, but they don't come onto the board till later. And my Cataphracti tend to be busy dealing with your infantry or, you know, tying up an objective and so they can't go hunt down the the Hellbringer Drakes. At least not without sacrificing objective control. So let's see, Vermin, you say that it's 100 Kingdoms first, then Nords, then Old Dominion. Nothing wrong with not being a fan of the dinosaurs. Not everybody has the same obsession with giant dinosaurs. I know any game we play with my wife, she's big into monsters. If there's dragons, she'll be running dragons. If there's dinosaurs, that's what she'll be running. Uh, I know she was quite disappointed that Hell didn't win the new vote, because she said that would have been her second army, because it was going to have all those drakes and stuff, which was exciting. It was an exciting idea. I'm actually pretty happy with Sorcerer Kings winning. I think they'll actually rival Old Dominion for my second place spot on favorite army in the long run. I mean, I can't say that 100% for sure because we don't know what the models look like exactly yet. We have rough ideas. And we don't know what their play style is going to be like. Maybe they won't be fun to play. You never know. I'm sure they'll be fun to play. I don't think there's any Conquest armies that aren't fun, because Conquest itself is just a fun game. But... Okay, I was wondering what your fourth option was there, Vermin. Oh, I agree with you there, Jocelyn. Uh, City-states are probably most of my 
non YouTube spending budget for the next few months. The rest of the year, maybe even. I have to split my spending money between multiple projects, though, because I have to be coming up with new stuff to be painting on the YouTube channel. For Conquest, it's easy, because I just use the Vanguard voucher to pick up a kit here and there, so I can paint a little bit of everything. But for, like, Warhammer, I have to buy all the models myself. And so, I can't just spend everything on the city-states project. I have to build it gradually with my extra, extra money. And I think we will still see hell. I think with how close the voting was, we might end up seeing another situation like the city-states, where city-states lost their vote but Parbellum saw that there was a lot of demand for him, and so they made them the, what is it, Seventh Army? So I am still working on the, uh, the cape and the loincloth and tabard and everything, in case anybody has wondered what I've wandered off into working on. There's a lot of highlighting to be done here. And this isn't even the final layer. I still gotta go back and do just the normal Temple Guard blue. So I think what we'll do is we'll get this blue color on. And we'll go back to the armor, just for the sake of variety so we don't get too boring here. And then after the armor, we'll come back to the cloak and do the other layer of highlighting. And then from there, it's one more layer of highlighting, and then the cloak and armor will both be done. Ish. And then we'll see where we go from there. I agree with you there, Christian. Uh, I do think it would be... It wouldn't surprise me at all to see the Weaver Courts be our ninth faction. I think our ninth faction will end up being another Parabellum choice where they pick the faction. And I think it ends up either being Weavers or hell, because I think they're excited about both those ideas. But who knows, they also said they want to try and make the uh, voting a once a year thing and not an every two year thing like it has been so far. So if that's the case, maybe they'll make us vote for hell versus Weaver Courts. I'd be super interested to see how the results of that vote go. I would be voting hell. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of the Weaver Courts concept, but maybe that's just because it's never been presented to me in a way that caught my attention. So Jocelyn, you ask what brushes I use. So because of how much painting I do, I don't like buying fancy brushes because I've found that I tend to wear them out just as fast, or at least close enough to just as fast that it's not quite worth it to spend extra money, at least on the brushes that I use for my basic painting. So what I do is I go to Walmart, and let me grab it. There are two sets of brushes that I like to buy. 
just depending on what's in stock when I go in. So the first is this folk art set here. Um, now obviously this one I've already opened and there's normally 10 brushes in here. But it comes with detail brushes, it has brushes that work for base coating, dry brushing, etc. And then the other one I buy is this brand here. And kind of the same thing, batch of 10 brushes of different sizes and types. And I think each one's only five or six dollars, so they're cheap. And when I start like a, when I start a new brush, they tend to go through a life cycle. Uh, the brushes will start as detail brushes, like the, the fine tip ones will. And then once they, after a few months of using them, after they hit the point where they're, they're not bad, they're not worn out completely, but they're not quite doing the fine detail anymore. I'll switch them to becoming like a fine, uh, a finer detail, like basing brush. And eventually they just progress all the way through to becoming base brushes and then throw away brushes and That's just me. That's how I do it. Now, I will say, if you're doing a lot of fine detail and like freehanding designs on your models, that's when I think it is worth it to go buy a fine detail sable hairbrush. The, the horse hairbrushes do good work. For fine detail at least but that's a brush that I would only use for doing those super fine details like I wouldn't be buying a horsehair brush and then using it for my base coating oh, my brush is coming apart this particular brush I'm using right now is a little bit newer and I've noticed when you get a new brush at least these ones where they have the metal heads on them that aren't plastic handles Sometimes, when you clean the brush, the water actually dissolves the glue that holds them together. So I just put super glue in there and glue them back together. I know, not a very good sales pitch for buying cheap brushes, but uh, that's what I use. I'll just be, be honest about what I use. I'm a cheapskate. So Texas Wargaming, you ask about basing for the models and the new rules. So where I also play quite a bit of First Blood, for me it makes sense to leave them on their bases like they were before. I magnetize all my bases, so I'm not too worried about doing dioramas. Now, I have seen some really cool work done with dioramic bases for Conquest models. And I think if that's the way you want to go, go for it. Go all in on the diorama. The big thing to note is that I believe Parabellum has said that if you're going to do tournament play, there will be a standard that you have to have the right number of models on each stand. So if the kit comes with four models to a stand, you're going to need to put all four on the, the diorama piece. But that's only if you're going to play in tournaments. If you're not going to ever go to a tournament, you're just going to play locally, then... Yeah, might as well just do a fancy diorama and put however many models on there you want to. If you only are using, say if you're doing a Wadroon and you only use three models per stand, I would understand. I wouldn't judge you too harshly. Okay, I think all that's left on this guy for this coat of blue is the plume. Now when you do the plume, you're going to want to use a finer detail brush and you're just catching the ridges. 
each of the individual feathers of the plume. Painted a little bit there. Not a huge problem. I can just get a little bit of water and oh, drop my brush. Why not? Can get just a little bit of water and absorb that excess paint or make it worse. Either way. You can also, if you overpaint, go back in with your shade color and redo the recesses, which I think might be the route that I'm going to take here. This is actually something I've been thinking about with my uh, characters for my city-states in particular. Um, my past character stands, I've just done a stand and I've just put basic texture paint on it and left the retinue spots open. But I'm thinking what I might do for my characters... Uh, I don't have one on hand, but for my wife's Wadroon, when they first came out, I made her a base plate using a cavalry stand. And I took the base, used it to like base a, a tree for terrain, and then I used the stand and sculpted a little bit more of a diorama with a single hole in the center of the base. And as long as you're just using the character with no retinue, that works fine. But what I was thinking for my city-states... So I have the the monster stand, right? I was thinking I could do a spot on the back where the character sits, or on the front. And most of the time I don't use all three retinue spots. I usually only use one or two, and so I was thinking if I put a circle here, so there's a model here, and a model here, those could be his retinue, or vice versa with him in the front. And then I could do something fancy with the diorama, and make it so that the base plates that go here and here are removable but have something scenic on them like a bush or a tree or something so that when he's by himself he's got a, a fancy diorama but when he has his retinue with him he has his retinue yeah so when it comes to retinues for your characters what the ruling that uh, Parabellum has given is that you don't have to use official models for them because not all the retinue models are released. And so it would be unfair to, you know, one army to have all their retinues released and another one doesn't yet. You do need to visually represent that you've given a retinue to your character. 
because the idea with most of Conquest's model design is that your opponent should be able to look at what you're taking and know what it is, roughly. They should be able to look at your character stand and be like, okay, this character's got some sort of retinue upgrade. I know that my brother, for his Dwegom, one of his retinue models is actually a 3D printed little fish man, like for D&D. And we, we like to call it a fish gnome, even though it's not quite a fish gnome, like you see in the little Conquest artwork. But it's kind of become a little joke that his Dwegom are supported by savage fish gnomes. <laughs> Glad I could help you clear up the thing about retinues, though. Like, it's important whenever you do anything with Conquest, you try to make it easier for your opponent to be able to tell what's going on. That's my philosophy. Like, if if I have the ability to convert something cool, I will. Like, for example, for my LVO list, I took a, uh, a banner that was giving my guys Aura of Death. Had I had time to, I would have converted the one of the banner bearer models from the old dominion because so i ended up getting this one uh the profane reliquary but it ended up coming with an arm missing it's the first time i've ever had a kit do that so what i was originally thinking is like okay i'll make this into a retinue model and i'll take a legionnaire arm and i'll you know get some green stuff and sculpt some extra robes and then i was going to start modifying the top you know make it so it's a banner instead of a you know, a relic icon. I think anything you can do to help your opponent visualize what's going on with your models is helpful. Okay, so now what we're gonna do... changed my mind. I was going to have us go do the bronze armor, but I think what I want to do is before I get too far into the armor, I want to get the base color for the skin on. Just because I think there's spots that are going to be harder to get the skin on. If I've already done all my layering on the armor, I'll have to end up going through and repainting it. So we're going to do some of that now. So we're going to start with Katie and Flesh Tone. This is kind of my go-to skin color. It's simple, it's easy. I usually don't spend a ton of time on skin when it's in small amounts. If I'm doing something like a troll or something where it's all skin, I'll put more time in. But on a model like this, there's not really any reason to go overboard on the skin because there's really just his thighs and a little bit of one of his arms that's showing. Now because there's some spots that are a little harder to get to, I am going to use a size 0 brush just so that I have good control when getting into the smaller recesses. So we'll go ahead and just start off with this armpit here. Now if I had a slightly larger brush that was in good condition right now, I might use that instead of this one because this one's a little too fine for base coating. But I think my size just up from this is not in super great condition right now. And we don't have to get perfect. Like, there's a, a smidgen of a gap where there's not paint in there, that's going to get covered up by wash later on once we shade the skin. So I don't have to be super perfect.
See, interestingly enough, I've never actually used Bugman's Glow. No particular reason why I haven't, I just haven't. I just don't own it, I guess. I've never bought it. So it's probably what's happened is I've never had a project where the paint scheme that Games Workshop tells me to do has ever called for that color. Because that's usually how I end up buying new colors is when I want to do a specific paint scheme and I look up how Games Workshop says to do it and then I just go buy those colors and experiment. But I have heard that it gets used a lot for skin. So, Texas Wargaming, you mentioned that you had a Nord's retinue come with a couple missing pieces. So, the only reason I didn't request replacement parts for this, uh, the profane reliquary guy that I had that was missing an arm, since it was a kit that I ordered using my, uh, using the reward stuff we get from the Vanguard program, I felt kind of guilty, I guess you could say, asking for a replacement bit when the model already didn't cost me anything to get in the first place. Because it was a promotional model that they sent me, so... I was like, you know what, we'll just... We'll just let it slide this time. And I'll just order another one to use as the actual Profane Reliquary, and then I'll convert this one. But yes, I'm sure if I had uh, contacted Parabellum, they would have sent me the replacement parts I needed. Good to know. I'll have to check out the, the Bugsman, Bugman's Glow. Pick up a pot of it next time I'm at the game store or something. Which probably won't be for a while. Probably not till the middle of next month, because that's when my next demo day is, and I don't really get out to the game stores if I'm not demoing Conquest. I'm weird like that. I just stay home and play at home. But it works, because my whole Conquest group comes here to my apartment to play, so it works out. So now that I'm doing the skin, I will say this is a spot that might have been worthwhile to do before we did the armor. The, kind of the armpits and the... The skin, at least on this spear arm, is a little annoying to get into the the tighter recesses without painting on stuff we already painted. You're not wrong there. The Old Dominion are fine with missing limbs. Doesn't bother them, I'm sure. I apologize if you guys can't really see what I'm doing right now. Getting into these recesses is hard to do it right and also show it on camera at the same time, because it just is. 
I can move my head and I can move the model, but I can't really move the camera to get into every recess so you guys can see it. Now the hardest area to get to is probably going to be right under here. So when you do your own, I definitely recommend at least doing the skin between the helmet and the main body before you start doing the armor and the cloak. Lesson learned here. That's kind of a cool idea. Make it look like the arm fell off as he's marching. It would uh, certainly make the conversion work very simple and straightforward. Oh, I totally missed a spot too. Which actually ends up being convenient. So right here there's armor. It's not just skin, it's his armor, his breastplate there. And I totally missed it, but it works out because now I can get at the neck. I don't have to worry about overpainting. I did overpaint a little bit, but luckily we have the color that we used for the cape right here, so we'll just touch it up. Okay, and then I think we've got to do his toes because this guy's wearing sandals. This is kind of like the old Dominion where you kind of have to decide how much you care about the details on the feet because the toes are not super defined. And so you could honestly get away with just calling it a leather flap that covers the front of the foot and just calling them shoes. And nobody would ever be the wiser. But I am going to make an effort to paint the toes. So it looks like the rest of the way up the sandal is leather straps that basically seal off the foot. The only other spot you have skin exposed is on the back of the foot. So here's a question for you guys. If we, so we only have 45 minutes left in tonight's stream based on what I had scheduled. So we're probably not gonna finish this miniature. We've got him at a point where like you could put him on the tabletop and he's technically got the three colors on him but he's not anywhere near being finished. Do I finish him? And we paint something else next week, like the Minotaurs? Or do I set this model aside and we paint it and finish it next week? So I don't know who told you that the minis are 54 millimeter. They're not that big. Conquest minis are 36 millimeters, so they're only about a head taller than a Warhammer model. Like, let's see. Do I have... I've got a Space Marine here. A Blade Guard vet next to a Hoplite. He's only a little bit larger. The main advantage to the size increase is really the spears. Like, most of the spears I've encountered in Conquest don't break super easily. 
I think the uh, the phalangite's the other variant of this kit. It's the first time I've ever seen a spear snap without the model totally getting crushed. Yeah, glad I could clarify. If nothing else, that at least removes a uh, expectation that these are huge minis with not a whole lot of detail. I say they have just about the right amount of detail for their size. Now, admittedly, my paint job's not doing much to uh, highlight all the cool details. This, the hoplites are probably the most basic armor design I've actually painted for conquest minis. Most of the Stuff like the old Dominion had a lot of, a lot more going on on the armor. This is mostly flat surfaces, which is kind of a change, and it's kind of fun from a painting perspective to have that difference. Now, there's this spot that's bugging me on the back of his thigh here, but I don't think there's a way I can get to it with the cape on. Eh, kind of, sort of. Good enough. Okay, we're going to shade his skin, and I think we're going to use Reichland Flesh Shade. I do, when it comes to shading skin, I do prefer Reichland over the Gilliman Flesh. Gilliman flesh comes out a little too dark, in my opinion. Uh, at least when you're trying to do uh, the Caucasian type skin. We are doing our best to not get this on the blue around it. The toes we don't have to worry about because we're going to be painting all the area around them later anyway. You could just be like me. I own all but one of the armies. The only army I don't own is the Dwegom. And that's mostly just because I've never ordered any of their minis and I've never done a paint tutorial other than the dragon for them. Oops, drop the model again. I've done that a few times now. Now, if you do happen to get the shade on the blue and you don't want to repaint the blue, as long as you catch it while it's still wet, you can just take your brush and absorb it back in. You just have to clean your brush out first. You can use a slightly finer brush to get the shade into the neck area. While we're thinking about it, we'll go ahead and get the uh, the bit of armor that we missed there around the neck. We'll just take a nice fine detail brush using the size zero brush again here and just getting in there and taking care of that armor. Oops, I totally bumped the camera there again.
now that we've uh, touched up that armor in there, we're going to go back through and just put a bit of the same shade we used. And luckily, like I said before, this metallic paint dries really fast, so we didn't even have to hardly wait. The amount of time it took me to get the paint out was enough for this to be dry enough to not be a problem. Cool. Good enough there. It's kind of interesting. Painting the city-states, I've actually been painting differently than I normally do. Normally, I would take and do all of the blue. Like, we haven't done our edge highlights, we haven't done our second layer of highlighting on the cape yet. Or I would do, like, all of the armor first, and I'd go from one piece to the other. This time I've been doing kind of like a little bit of everything. Which is kind of an interesting change. These models have so much... They have so many different little colors that you do need to do to make them look good that it just kind of makes sense to go back and forth. It also makes it so if I have to stop this project halfway through, the model looks good enough to go on the tabletop. So, I think... Let's go ahead and start touching up our armor a little bit. So, I'm going to make a mixture here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take two parts, this Pro Acryl Copper, and then one part Gehenna's Gold. The reason we're mixing this is because um, you might not be able to really tell. I can tell a difference. But when you look at this little shield here, this was my prototype for figuring out what color is going to do. This corner here is the copper color by itself. This is the copper and the gold in a one-to-one -one mixture. And then this corner here is a two to one copper, two parts, gold one part. And I didn't like how kind of silvery this one came out. And I didn't like how gold this one came out. So I ended up doing the middle one. You, it's a very, very picky detail that the majority of people probably won't even notice. I think picking the right bronze colors was the hardest part of this uh, this project. So I'm just mixing that paint right now. I guess I can kind of show the mixing process. Um, one thing you have to be careful with, with the Pro Acryl um, metallics, you can't water them down as much as you can with the Citadel ones, because they have a, almost like a Lamia medium portion to the, uh, the paints that separates when you add water. So you have to be careful with that whenever you work with the Pro Acryl metallics. But I have been really happy with this particular metallic, the, the copper. It has a very pearlescent finish that I really like. To give you an idea of how this model is going to change when we start doing the highlighting here, the layering. So this is the, the copper, right? The Balthazar Gold. And this is how it comes out after doing the layering. Not quite a gold, but no longer just copper. I am using the size zero brush on this. And the main reason I do this is because, like, there's some small areas up in here 
that you're not going to be able to get with a larger brush. It also gives me a lot of control if I want to leave, say, like the there's a little bit of a darker recess in the center of this belly plate. If I wanted to, this smaller brush allows me to just paint all the way around it. And I'm not going to, but if there was a spot where it made sense to leave the recess darker, I would be able to a lot easier than if I was using a larger brush. Ooh, I put too much paint there. But we're just going to go along to the armor. And I kind of messed up the belly plate there a little bit. I'll have to go touch it up with some shades later. But I like to layer when I work with metallics. After doing the shade, I like to layer a slightly brighter, more pearlescent metallic at the center of each armor panel. So that it still becomes shiny. Like, these guys... As shiny models go, these are probably one of the few kits in Conquest that can get away with being decked out in all shiny, bright armor. Them and Hundred Kingdoms. Everybody else kind of has rusty armor or just like leather armor. Or just armor that doesn't make sense to be shiny. This model doesn't have it as much as, say, like the, uh, the pull mark. When I painted him, he's wearing one of those breastplates that has all the, like the six pack sculpted in. And so painting this way on him was very rewarding. It was almost similar to like highlighting flesh. The only thing I've heard. Concerning Founders exclusives is I've been told that the City States one is going to look really cool. So take that as you will, but the fact that I've heard a City States one mentioned indicates that maybe this year's is going to be a City States Founders. Um, it did sound like there's only going to be one Founders exclusive again this year, but that is 100% purely rumor. I don't have any, like, that's just chatter I've heard. I've not heard any official statement either way on the Founders exclusive this year. But those you do tend to drop closer to Christmas time, so I wouldn't expect it anytime soon. Is there a particular kit you think would be cool to see made up as a Founders exclusive? So like, I personally am kind of hoping that when they do a City States Founders exclusive, it's either the Eidolon, like an alternate sculpt for him, or I think they could even do a special sculpt of the Minotaurs and give us the six-pack bodybuilder minotaur that we saw in the concept art as a Founders ex exclusive. I think that would be a cool collector model, and that's one I would buy. I generally don't buy the Founders exclusives when they're just like a character with his retinue. I don't know, those ones just don't catch my attention, but like when it's ones where it's like... Both of the Spire ones we've gotten have been cool, where they're brute versions of characters. Um, one of them's an alternate uh, lineage highborn, and the other is a biomancer that's a brute. Those kind of Founders exclusives I really enjoy. 
but I wasn't super crazy about the Old Dominion one. Like, it's cool. It's very cool. It just wasn't one that had the same utility for me. It wasn't as useful. So normally I ask this earlier on in the evening and I forgot tonight, but are you guys working on any cool projects while you uh, watch the stream tonight? Okay, so we got Czar G. Flea's working on some salamanders. Can't wait to see those. I've seen some of your salamanders you've done in the past, and those usually turn out looking pretty awesome. And then Jocelyn is working on, looks like Malifaux minis. That's pretty cool. Uh, that was a game that I always thought looked interesting, but I've never actually tried it. I've never known anybody that's played it. But I hear that it doesn't use, it's not like other war games, I hear that it's mostly uh, card based I think is what I've heard about it, which sounds super interesting. Kind of funny as I'm sitting here doing this stream, I've got my phone uh, sitting here on the arm of my chair. And I think I have a friend who didn't realize that I would be streaming tonight because I've had probably four or five phone calls in the last hour. So hopefully there's nothing going wrong there. Hopefully he's just wondering if I'm free to hang out or something and there's not like somebody dying. <laughs> Since this is only the second time I've streamed, though, I'm not surprised that not everybody knows that's what I'm doing on Friday nights now. So, Pascal, you say that you're transferring your Citadel paints to better pots. I've always been curious, What uh, do you have any recommendations for good pots for that? Because I've just always used the default Citadel ones and just kind of dealt with the fact that I will have to uh, occasionally clean the, the openings or just throw away dried paint on paints I haven't used for a while. But if you've got good bottle recommendations, I wouldn't mind hearing them. Um, and then Texas Wargaming, painting up some Zangors I see, is what you've said here. Zangors are actually really cool. My wife plays Thousand Sons for one of her 40k armies. 
And she has a ton of Zangors, but she's not as into painting as I am, so chances are I will end up painting those someday. So who knows, maybe there'll be a tutorial on Zangors someday down the road when I get around to working on little side projects like that. Oh, this is an annoying spot. So the back of this leg piece, you can see it from pretty much every angle on the model, but you can't actually get to it with the brush from like any angle. So it might look a little sloppy on the inside of this leg. Oh well. Sometimes that's the way it goes. The only solution to that would be to leave the cape off. Which, you guys might be wondering why I bothered putting the capes on. The main reason was because you can't put the head on without the cape. Because the capes don't quite fit around the head. I mean, I guess you could. Um, but then the second reason was for the purposes of lining up the shields. Um and picking which shield was going to go with which guy, I needed the capes in place so that I could figure out which shields fit on which arm. Oh, hey, I should probably paint the uh, inside of that shield, too. There's skin in there. Okay, now we've got the helmet. almost thought maybe for a second we were done with the, the bronze, but I realized I completely forgot the helmet. I think most of the uh, of the Chaos Demon models and the like demon-like things that Warhammer has, Zinch are probably some of the funnest ones. Like the the bird aesthetic and all the bright blues and pinks and purples are just fun to work with. Good to know. I'll have to look for that. Does he say there's a pack of 50 of the bottles? I'll, I'll have to go do some searching. It's not a super huge priority project. I tend to burn through paint fast enough that it might be a waste of time to rebottle them anyway. It just happens when you paint all day every day. You tend to use up a lot of paint. Especially colors like Lead Belcher and Agrax Earthshade. I probably burn through an Agrax Earthshade every month or two. I might make it three months sometimes without having to restock the shade paints. Okay, there we go. Starting to look pretty good. So we've got the uh, armor layered up. We're gonna do the shield next. I have worked with the little steel balls in some of my Citadel paints. There's a few in particular that you definitely want to do that with. Any of the whites, if you buy white paint from pretty much any company, those things, they just form clots and they dry out really bad. And so a, a mixing ball is always really useful for those. So with this method that I'm using for painting the metal, if you wanted to make your metal look dirty, like it's got lots of tarnishing going on, you would just simply not 
paint as clean of a layer of paint over it. You might go and maybe paint one edge, but leave spots where there's the color underneath showing. I found that that always really easily helps establish the look of tarnished metal. Um, especially when I paint orcs, because I actually, my orcs are gold, gold and blue for their armor. If you've watched any of my orc tutorials, you've seen that before. But for them in particular, not completely layering the paint helps make them look a lot more dirty and weathered and not as clean. And obviously these particular models I'm going for clean. That's kind of the aesthetic I've chosen for the army. So Pascal, retinues are actual models. Um, I confess I don't own any retinue models, but they do sell little kits. They usually come with three to four models, and they're usually just kind of like an excuse for Parabellum to make a more scenic model, a more fancy like version of one of your infantry guys. But they have, uh, eventually, every army will have a tactical retinue, an arcane retinue, and then some sort of faction-specific retinue. Um, so, for example, the Old Dominion in their rules have the... Um, is it like Regalia of the Old Dominion retinue or something like that? that will eventually have a kit that corresponds with it but those kits are not considered high priority because they've just kind of ruled it as you can use whatever models you want as long as you represent that there is a retinue on the stand mainly I think I would assume that they've done that because if you were them and you only could produce so many kits a year and your choices are produce a retinue kit or a kit of infantry that actually add to the gameplay of an army most of the time you're going to pick the unit that actually adds to the gameplay and not the retinue I think uh, Dwegom have their tactical and arcane retinue I think 100 Kingdoms do I know for sure the 100 Kingdoms at least have the tactical because I've seen it before Um, and I don't know if uh, I don't know what other retinue kits are out there. Come to think of it, I've never really taken time to look. I know that the Old Dominion, their Founders exclusive kit, the extra models that come on there. So one of the models is an alternate model for one of the characters, and then the rest of the models are actually the tactical retinue. That's another part of the reason why I didn't pick up that Founders exclusive, the heavy metal one, because with one of the past Dwegom Founders exclusives, they put retinue models in it, and then, you know, six months later, they released those retinue models as the retinue kit without the diorama base. And so I was like, well, I might as well just wait, and maybe, you know, sometime later this year, we'll just see those. Old Dominion Retinue models come to the game as a separate kit. So once again, like, you don't necessarily have to do the inside of the shield. Because the inside of the shield is going to be, for the most part, pushed against the model. So you won't really see it. Uh, I would do the arm on the inside of the shield, but, like, doing all the layering and detail work on the inside of the shield isn't necessary. I'm also not being as exact with it on the back of the shield, even though I am painting it.
they may have very well done the same thing for the Nords. Like I said, I don't actually remember who all has retinue kits yet. I've never bought one personally because uh, the only army I've played enough to actually use the retinues is the Old Dominion and they don't have theirs yet outside of that uh, Founders exclusive. So on the shield here we are going to leave all the trim because I think I'm going to go back through with Lead Belcher later on and uh, make that all silver. So we only have 10 minutes left, um, so I'm not going to dive too far into the next step. All the next step is going to be is me taking the Temple Guard Blue by itself and layering that over the last layer of blue. And I think what I'll do is I'll put it up for a vote, I'll do a poll on my community tab right after the stream ends and we'll see if people would rather see me continue this model next week or if they'd rather see me start on the minotaurs the minotaurs will definitely be a two <clears throat> excuse me a two-week project because we'll probably spend an hour and a half just layering up the skin on the minotaurs I've got some fun plans for them Okay, so yeah, we're going to layer this blue over the capes. Now, since we did the transition color, we're not going to go quite up to the edge of the transition color that we used before this. We'll stop a little bit short. That way the transition to the brighter color is a little more gradual and not as sudden. And this is where the cape really starts getting bright. One of the other kind of fun advantages to doing multiple layers where you build up the color gradually, you can add lines to the cape that aren't actually sculpted into the model. So for example, like right here, I left a little kind of partial stripe of the darker color underneath to give the appearance of a wrinkle there that's not sculpted. And that comes in handy, especially with models like these. These capes really aren't all that wavy compared to other capes I've painted. So using the paint to give the appearance of more wrinkles is, is good. Now if you wanted to do something similar to this scheme but didn't want to go quite as light on the blue, um, my brother noticed when we were at the game store the other day buying paints that if you bought Thousand Suns blue, it's a shade of blue that's only just barely slightly lighter than the Sotek green we started with. And so if you wanted to do more of that darker teal blue color you could do it pretty easily and it would probably turn out looking pretty good um, I personally wanted to go for the lighter color but I think my brother's actually planning on doing the 
slightly darker tone to his capes. So that might be a way to do variation on this scheme and make it look a little more to your preference if you're not into the super light colored cape. Oh, sorry, you're right. It was Aramon Blue, not Thousand Suns Blue. Thank you for the correction. I knew it had something to do with the Thousand Suns. <laughs> Sometimes with all these crazy paint names that are out there, it can be hard to keep track which is which. Especially, uh, I know both Games Workshop and uh, Privateer Press, both of their brands of paint, all the names are based on you know characters in their game. And so the, the names don't transfer over to other companies that have basically the same color. And sometimes you'll get paints that are made by different companies that look almost identical and are just ever so slightly off in their color. Well, we're nearing the end of the stream, so if you guys have any more questions, now would be a good time to ask them. Otherwise, they'll have to wait for next week. I will say that no matter what the poll ends up deciding, if we're painting this model next week, cool. If we're not, also cool. This particular model would be the only one that doesn't get finished. I will finish the other three because I'm going to be working on that hoplite tutorial over the next couple days because I want the hoplite tutorial to ideally be out sometime Tuesday evening. And then be watching tomorrow. I'm not sure what time of day yet, but some point tomorrow, my poll mark video will go up. And it's basically the same scheme we did today, but uh, you'll get to walk through the whole paint scheme. And it'll only be a you know six minute long video instead of this three hour live stream. So it'll be a lot better for going back to reference if you decide you want to mimic the scheme or mimic elements of it. But yeah, it looks like that's going to be our stopping point right there. Not bad. Uh, I figured we wouldn't make it all the way through, but we did get close. From here, what would be left to do we would be
be doing some lead belcher on here. We'd probably be doing some on the trim here, these little ridges on the body armor. Um, maybe a detail or two on the helmet. The tip of the spear would be lead belcher. We'd do some sort of brown for the haft. We would do a light brown for all the leather tassets and the sandals. Um, we also have one more highlight on the blue that I do. Uh, just a very fine edge highlight using Baharoth blue. So there's not a ton left. We'll probably be able to finish this guy in another hour if we kept going at it. So, But thank you guys for joining tonight, for watching. Um, I'm very appreciative of all the support you guys give me. We'll do this again next week at the same time. And you guys have an amazing night. And we'll catch you in the next one.